Well, 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 Brianna, what's on your radar? Uh, well, Robbie, a lot of things. As this very media literate, media literate audience is well aware, claims about misinformation have repeatedly been used as a cudgel to repress speech rights over the last few years. Facts that are now considered well-settled science, like the protective value of a previous COVID infection, were once grounds for censorship on social media. Twitter censored the Hunter Biden laptop story, despite its factual legitimacy. And perhaps most famously, Russiagate was ground zero for censorship regimes across social media platforms. Labeling information that's inconvenient to the establishment as misinformation has long been a tool to sanitize or suppress said information at the same time that actual lies are trumpeted frequently by establishment actors. Who can forget, of course, the post-9-11 landscape when critics of the war in Iraq were labeled pro-terrorist, even as our government was lying about the existence of weapons of mass destruction. Or the fake incubator baby's testimony that propelled the United States into the first Gulf War. That's why it's so important to be cautious with the facts emerging out of Gaza, especially those facts which are being used actively to justify what multiple humanitarian organizations and civil rights groups have described as a prospective genocide in Gaza. Importantly, Israeli state actors have repeatedly based the scale of their retaliation for the October 7th Hamas attack on the brutality of the attack, not just the number of victims who were killed. After all, we're way past an eye for an eye at this point. Israel has revised the October 7th death toll down to a little under 1,200 civilians and soldiers. By contrast, since October 7th, over 11,000 Palestinians have been killed, nearly half of whom are children. Moreover, the remaining 2.3 Palestinians have been denied water, food, electricity, and medical supplies, leading to a broader human health crisis. Between 13 and 18 percent of all structures in Gaza have been destroyed as of a week ago, including 45 percent of Gaza's housing. 50,000 pregnant women cannot access potable water in Gaza. Children are enduring amputations without painkillers. And people trapped under rubble who might otherwise be saved are left to die because the lockdown, the blockade on gas, that could be used to power construction equipment needed to get them out under the building cannot flow into the territory. Now, Israel has responded to critics in several ways. Its re representatives have invoked its right to defend itself. But putting to the side that arguments that Gaza is an illegally occupied territory that has a right to defend itself under international law, as the death toll becomes more and more disproportionate over time, what's occurring in Gaza does start to feel less and less credibly described as self-defense. Increasingly, it seems, Israel is relying on other narratives, chiefly that Hamas is uniquely barbaric and that this barbarism implicitly justifies Israel's inhumane treatment of the 2.3 million residents of Gaza. As Elliot Cohen wrote of Hamas in the Atlantic in the days after the attack, barbarians fight because they enjoy violence. They do not only kill and maim, the armies of civilized states do that, of course, all the time, but go out of their way to inflict pain, to torture, to rape, and above all, to humiliate. Jesse Klein in the National Post was more explicit. He wrote, Footage of Hamas barbarism shows why ceasefire is not an option. Israelis take steps to avoid civilian casualties. Hamas revels in their slaughter. Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant justified what international aid organizations like the UN have called collective punishment by saying, we are fighting human animals. President Isaac Herzog claimed there are no innocent civilians in Gaza. And Prime Minister Netanyahu invoked the biblical story of Amalek in which God commands King Saul to kill them all. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. More recently, in response to questions about whether or not Israel's repeated hospital bombings are really self-defense, Israeli government spokesperson Elon Levy responded with a familiar argument that the nature of the Hamas attack justified Israel's month-long se month siege, regardless of the high civilian body count. Now, let's take a listen. You're right, the optics are bad, but we are not fighting for our image. We are fighting for survival. The optics of the October 7th massacre are even worse. 1,200 people who were brutally executed, butchered, beheaded, burned, many of them tortured and mutilated. Before they were killed, their bodies mutilated. After they were killed, that is the enemy we are fighting against, the genocidal terror group that is promising to murder every man, woman, and child in the country, and is telling us that if we do not stop, it will do another October 7th and another October 7th until it has murdered all of us and destroyed the state of Israel. That is what we are fighting against. And our right to self-defense, our duty of self-defense, is to eliminate the terrorist organization that did that. 
Now, in light of that kind of language that's being used to justify Israel's siege on Gaza, it's obviously important to know the facts of what actually happened on October 7th. You've got to nail those down. If Israel's disproportionate response hinges on the unique barbarism of Hamas as compared to Israel's or Western governments like our own, who, of course, as the authors earlier wrote, bomb with impunity frequently, isn't that important to prove said barbarity? Now, unfortunately, Israel has a long history, like the United States, of dabbling in misinformation. For example, recall how long it took for Israel to admit that one of its soldiers had killed American Palestinian journalist Sharina Abu Akhla. First Prime Minister Naftali Bennett said the May 11, 2022 killing was likely the fault of Palestinian fighters. His office even tweeted a video of Palestinian gunmen shooting into the Janine refugee camp to substantiate their claims. That video, however, was debunked within hours by Israeli human rights group Bet Salem, who pointed out that the gunmen were in a completely different part of the camp and that no Palestinian fighters were near where Abu Akhla was killed. Days later, the Israeli military argued that it had identified the weapon that killed her, an IDF soldier's weapon, but that it could not confirm who actually killed her without having the bullet in their possession. Still months later, Israel conceded that there was a high possibility that Abu Akhla had been, quote, accidentally hit but that there would be no criminal investigation. A year of denials passed before Israel finally admitted and apologized for slaying the journalist. More recently, recordings that Israel offered to prove that Ahi Baptist Hospital was struck by a rocket from Palestine rather than Israel were questioned by Channel 4 News reporters who considered it, quote, an obvious fabrication. The outlet reported that two independent Arab journalists told us the same thing because of the language, accent, dialect, syntax, and tone, none of which they say was credibly from people in Gaza. Similarly, a video purporting to show a nurse in Al-Shifa Hospital saying that Hamas had attacked the hospital and were stealing the medicine went viral. An official government, Israeli government account, posted the video, but then later deleted it after journalists failed to find any doctors or nurses at the hospital who recognized the alleged nurse, and after Arabic speakers pointed out that she seemed to have an Israeli accent. Now, just a few days ago, the IDF claimed to have found an Arabic translation of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf in a, quote, children's living room in a house in Gaza that they say Hamas used as a base. The IDF spokesperson argued that this was evidence that Hamas's goals were genocidal, much like Hitler's. Journalists, including Glenn Greenwald, were skeptical, pointing out that the news was being spread by a known propaganda page. Others thought it was suspicious that the book appeared to be in such good condition as if newly purchased, perhaps planted, while still others questioned that the likelihood that a child in a war zone would be neatly annotating an adult book with highlighters and post-its. Now, of course, maybe Palestinian children really are studying Mein Kampf. The question remains, is that cause to bomb and kill 4,000 of them? Another example of shifting narratives we've covered extensively is I-24 News' report that 40 babies had been not just killed but beheaded by Hamas. After saying he'd personally seen images of that atrocity, Biden issued a retraction, acknowledging that he had not seen any evidence that the beheadings had happened. Since then, leading Israeli paper Haaretz has been doing the very important work of naming, counting, providing pictures of, and providing additional information on all of the people who were so horribly killed by Hamas on October 7th. This work not only highlights the individual humanity of the lives lost that day, it also reveals that the demographics of those killed that day were somewhat different than what Israel has been claiming. While those lives are no less valuable, it is now clear that 1,175, not 1,400, were killed on that day, and that just one baby, a precious 10-month-old named Mila Cohen, was among the dead. Moreover, while the majority of those killed were civilians in clear violation of international law, about 30 percent were either IDF soldiers or police officers, somewhat complicating the narrative that Hamas targeted civilians specifically and exclusively. Add to that testimony from Israeli survivors that a troubling number of Israelis were actually killed by IDF in the crossfire is still tragic, but different a picture begins to emerge here. Now, again, these facts matter because a central aspect of Israel's message has been that its murder of over 11,000 civilians, including over 4,000 children, and the collective punishment of 2.3 million Gazans is justified not by the number of Israelis killed on October 7th, which is obviously at this point dwarfed by the number of Palestinian innocents that have been killed in retribution, but by the nature of Hamas's crime. Now, weeks ago, Rashida Tlaib was condemned for accusing Israel of bombing Al-Ahi Baptist Hospital. 
While there are reasonable doubts about who was responsible for that attack, she's been no, by no means vindicated. She may have been wrong. What is clear now is that those who defended Israel on the basis that it would never violate international law by targeting a hospital ever were absolutely wrong. Today, nearly all Gazan hospitals have been rendered inoperational. Repeated Israeli strikes have damaged the Al-Quds Hospital and struck well-marked ambulances out front. This is according to Human Rights Watch. The World Health Organization reported that as of November 10th, 18 out of 36 hospitals and 46 out of 72 primary care clinics were forced to shut down due to both attacks and a lack of electricity and fuel. Yesterday, Doctors Without Borders was able to speak to one of its staff members still at Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza. Here's what they said, quote, we don't have electricity. There's no water in the hospital. There's no food. People will die in a few hours without functioning ventilators. In front of the main gate, there are many bodies. There are also injured patients. We can't bring them inside. When we sent the ambulance to bring the patients a few meters away, they attacked the ambulance. There are injured people around the hospital. They're looking for medical care. We can't bring them inside. There's also a sniper who attacked patients. They have gunshot wounds. We operated on three of them. There are 600 patients, 37 babies, someone who needs an ICU. We can't leave them. Now, three of those babies died over the weekend. Workers at Al-Shifa have reported burying dozens of bodies in a mass grave yesterday because they started to decompose and were causing a health hazard. According to Israel, the rationale for the siege against these hospitals and the civilians who have taken shelter there is ostensibly that Hamas has facilities under these hospitals. Specifically, they argue that the IDF claims El Rantisi, sorry, especially a specialized hospital for children, was a cover for a Hamas armory. Now, according to the New York Times, patients and staff are thought to have fled that hospital over the weekend after it was surrounded by Israeli forces. And IDF soldiers took videos inside the hospital released earlier this week, which purport to show explosives in a hostage room. Almost immediately, however, the video's authenticity was challenged, not just by Hamas, which unsurprisingly denied the claims, but by Arabic speakers who pointed out that a piece of paper taped to a wall, which IDF Admiral Hagari claimed was a schedule for guarding hostages, was in fact a calendar, a standard administrative finding in a hospital. The calendar did not include people's names, as you might expect from a hostage schedule. It just said days of the week in Arabic. Now, Israel is calling this uh, misinformation a translation error. Okay, well, moreover, the armory the IDF claims to have found at the hospital was comprised of about five or six guns. You can see pictured in the video. And as the New York Times noted in their reporting, in the New York Times own reporting, were arranged in the style of a police hall from a drug raid, well displayed in a group as opposed to pictured in C2 where they might have been found, leading some to draw analogies to famous instances of police planting evidence, evincing some caution. The Times noted that it could not independently confirm the providence of the weaponry. The video also purported to show Hamas tunnels under the, fact, uh, the facility, but whether those are tunnels or an elevator shaft has been challenged, and the IDF admits that it has not investigated where those tunnels lead, nor will it allow independent third parties to do so. Notably, a week ago, Israel claimed that they'd found a tunnel under a different hospital, and that claim was debunked. An independent investigation by journalists found that that alleged tunnel was, in fact, a water reservoir. Now, certainly, I want to be clear, it could be the case that Hamas was holding hostages in the Al-Shifa basement. The calendar did start on October 7th and was titled al Aska Flood Battle, Hamas's name for the October 7th attack. And back in 2015, Amnesty International did a report, did report rather, that Hamas was using a disused outpatient clinic on the grounds of Al-Shifa Hospital for unlawful violent activity. But remember, as head of Refugees International and former Obama staffer pointed out just yesterday, under international human law, it's illegal to attack hospitals anyway. And even if we don't respect international law, given the factual dispute and the huge retributive toll Israel has already inflicted on the people of Gaza, the question remains, why not have a ceasefire? Why not halt killing until, at very least, the crimes, the barbarism, the complicity Palestinians have been charged with? which are said to justify this mass murder and collective punishment, are in fact proven. And what about the actions that cannot be plausibly argued to have anything to do with rooting out Hamas? Are the IDF snipers firing at, pi at patients through the hospital window, patients lying in their hospital beds? Is that really about targeting Hamas? What does Hamas have to do with the spike of attacks on Palestinians in the West Bank by Israeli settlers and IDF officers who've killed nearly 200 Palestinians there already? 
there's no Hamas in the West Bank. What do we do with reporting from the Times of Israel that the IDF, along with the settlers they routinely arm in the West Bank, that they bound, stripped, beat, burned, and urinated on three Palestinians? If a disproportionate response from Israel is justified by the brutality of the October 7th attack, what does it mean if there were no beheaded babies or torture or mutilation to begin with? What does it mean if we discover that Israel has also been guilty of torture and murder of children as well as Hamas? They've been described as barbaric. Are we going to say the same of Israel? Are we willing to walk down the road of what Hamas would be entitled to do following Israel's own logic? At what point does it no longer make sense to blame Hamas rather than Israel for the mass killing of children and other civilians? Bombing hospitals, killing 100 UN staffers, bombing all 11 universities in Gaza, and targeting patients with drones in their hospital beds? Dare I even mention the ongoing 75-year occupation and what response that might merit, if not morally, than under international law that sanctions armed resistance to illegal occupation? Well, there's a lot there, um, so I'll keep my response short. You said that under international law, a hospital is not a legitimate target, and that is true, but it becomes a legitimate target under international law, under the Geneva Conventions, if it is, in fact, a headquarters for terrorism. It loses that protected status. Obviously, we can't fully adjudicate right now claims and whether there's a they're accurate. Um, the Al-Shifa hospital in particular was used by Hamas as a headquarters in 2014 when Hamas broke the ceasefire that what Egypt brokered back then. You could see there were <laughs> images of Hamas soldiers in the windows. Again, I don't, and, and people watching think I like uncritically accept everything the Israeli government and the U.S. government tells me. Obviously, that is not the case. We should be very critical, and we should seek other sources of corroboration information. I don't just accept what they say in the same way that I don't just accept what the Gaza Health Ministry says is the claim. These are both sides engaging in propaganda on their behalf. Um, but I would not rule out the possibility that there are, in fact, terrorists at that hospital, as have been in the past. So what we do know, and Tablet was reporting this out, that there are, in fact, tunnels under El Shifa Hospital. We know that because when Israel was not just peripherally occupying, but physically occupying Gaza, it built those tunnels. So there's no question as to whether or not there is tunnel infrastructure under the hospital. Israel is very familiar with them. It built them. The question is whether or not it's being used for the purposes that as being described, and whether or not that still justifies not only bombing the hospital, but shooting patients through the window, as has been reported. Now, I don't know that we have the time to sit here and fact check international law, but I would reiterate that uh, the uh, argument that's being made um, by the former uh, Obama staffer and president of Refugees International, Jeremy Konyendik, is that specifically, under international law, I'm quoting him now, hospitals enjoy special protections against attack. The alleged presence of military activity in a hospital does not waive those protections. An attacking force is still obligated to do everything feasible right. to avoid it. I, I read that. There was a community notes under it, and I clicked through to uh, from. Geneva Conventions article saying that that was not accurate if it is a headquarters for terrorists. That you have to verify that. So let me, so let me ask you that. I obviously don't have time to go back and forth. I've seen not just him, but there was another a UN rep rapporteur who was making remarks mm -hmm. just yesterday, I believe in Australia, who reiterated this argument. But let's let's take for let's just take for the sake of argument that you're right. What obligation does Israel have to prove that it is, in fact, a headquarters? What makes it a headquarters versus a place where there are some Hamas in the tunnels? What, what does Israel have to, to do to prove that this hospital is a headquarters? And then what are the implications? If this is the headquarters, what does it mean about all of the other hospitals, including the hospital where the raid took place over the weekend, the children's hospital? I mean, I would like to see any— That those, that those have been sure. I would like, also targeted. I would like all that evidence publicized. But obviously, it has to be the case— that you can, because I mean, if it were the situation that hospitals or whatever it is are always off limits in all circumstances, that would actually provide terrorist groups incentive to be there, be, because they, then they wouldn't be able to be touched under international human rights law, right? So that 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 would be a very bad way to structure 
the Geneva Conventions. Because no, the argument is you don't you don't bomb the entire hospital structure from right. hundreds of miles well, away. Well, Al-Shifa is being, well, it had ground forces go yeah, in. I, I wish we didn't get to a segment covering, that's a pretty um, big news that happening over last night. But yes, they finally, after bombing this and the substantial majority of hospitals in the north of Gaza, immobilizing every hospital in Gaza over the course of the four, last four weeks, they're now just now sending in ground troops. And the argument isn't that you have to allow a terrorist organization to be safe and un targeted in a hospital, but that you do have to weigh the balance of civilian risk and send in troops to actually do an investigation, to actually go down into the tunnels and not just say, we know Hamas is there, so we're allowed to bomb civilian centers, refugee camps, hospitals, universities, et cetera, with impunity. All right, we'll leave it there. More rising right after this.